Hello, Hillary. Hi, my my other my other Zoom call finished early. Nice. Hello there, Chris. Hey guys. Good to see you. So I'm just gonna do a quick intro and then we're just gonna roll into this. Right. Um if everyone's cool with that. Um so it's yeah, Hillary? We're getting we're I'm getting feedback. I'm getting I'm getting like is it me? How about you, Chris? Are you getting feedback? No feedback. Okay, I'm gonna come in and out again. Okay, no problem. Okay, I, I hear everything twice. So I'm coming, I'll go leave and I'll come back in. Okay, make sure you don't have the Facebook page open or something where it's like it's <gasps> Yeah. That's probably what I do. You can mute it if you've got the kind of the page open or close it or whatnot. There. There we go. Sorry. Is it better? Is it better? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> All right. Well, Ready. we're better better late than never, right? So tonight we it's 8 p.m. here in Germany where I am. I think it's 11 a.m. on the West Coast where Chris is. If Chris, are you West Coast or were you Colorado? Colorado, right? So is it 12? Yeah. 12, 12 in Colorado, and let's see, it's two, two, 2 o'clock in Toronto, yeah, Hillary? That's it. I love it, around the world. So this is the uh, Passion is the Gateway Drug Playcast, which is now in service to the Alternative Reality Summit for Mental Health Reformation. I'm joined by my co-host, Hillary Van Welter, and our grit, our Chris, our, uh, that's a combination of guest <laughs> and Chris. Our guest, Chris Emerson, tonight. And we're brought together by this mutual passions and from different perspectives on mental health, mental illness, mental health reformation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is being broadcast in a Facebook group that we've started based on a little bit of a video call I put out a couple of weeks ago. And this is episode 555 of the Playcast series. <laughs> there hasn't been 550, uh, four, 54 yet, Chris. I just like to go out of order. So. Um, <laughs> based on synchronicity. That's one of my favorite numbers, actually. So it's going to be a fun special show. And this, this episode is titled, what did I, I actually titled, I looked up a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson when I saw your name. Um, I'm related. Find, yeah. What's that? Are you? I'm actually related. He's my second cousin, 14 times removed. <laughs> I love it. There you go. I like to, I like to make the titles just as a springboard sometimes or for, you know, to get into a conversation and I picked a quote from Emerson that was something like, I, I can't even find it here. I'm not well prepared, like with one my different one. screen. Yeah. One of my favorite it? quotes, one of my favorite quotes by him is all of life is an experiment. The more experiments you run, the better. Mm. That's also a very, very um, apropos quote for what we're going to get into tonight. So I'm also very excited because Chris, Hillary, Hillary and I know each other. We've been working on a project together for the past year. But we have never met Chris. So what I really like about these playcasts is people have been responding to my video or someone shares it with a friend and I'm like, come on, let's go live. I have not done any vetting. I don't know anything about Chris other than we probably have shared some shared experiences and passions and we're all creative and innovators. But I'm kind of excited. I don't do any vetting. I don't know anything. So it's kind of jumping in to the deep end. And Chris doesn't probably know much either. <laughs> I could do something completely outlandish or you could, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're going to jump in. We're just going to do a quick kind of check in. Is everyone okay? I'll start it off as a model. Like I'm here. I'm happy to be here. I'm present. Everything's good. I've had a great day and uh, I'm all good. And I'm, I'm happy to be here. How about you, Hillary? I just came from an opening ceremony of 99 days of peace where we partnered with a native elder, like a nature, sorry, a nature elder. And um, to, to uh, bring in this 90, bring in these 99 day of days of peace. And it was fascinating to listen to a hundred people around the world and what na nature elder they were bringing in. We had the Ganji, we had, we had the Mississippi, we had uh, various rocks and trees from all around the world that joined, that joined us to uh, welcome in peace. So that's where I came from. So rather an exciting, uh, exciting hour I just spent with, a, with, with nature and some very interesting people. Awesome. How about you, Chris? How are you doing today? Super excited to be here. Yeah, super excited to just, I love talking and meeting new people. And so 
yeah, just ready to explore. And I've got a whole quart of uh, cold chicken broth. And so re ready to rock. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's, that's, that's perfect. So I'm, a, I'm actually going to, um, Chris, what I like to do is I like to have conversation where we weave in our, some of our life's journey or our background, rather than just, we all just do soliloquies and introduce ourselves for 20 minutes. We're going to kind of just find a way to jump into some conversation here. And then I do invite you though, as you speak, if it's, you know, relevant and it, it works, tell us something about your journey or your past or what you love to do and just kind of weave those things into some of your conversation with us as, as it feels uh, aligned for you. So I just found, we're going to start with this actual quote that I found from Emerson, which was, without ambition, one starts nothing. Um, because basically, I think that's reflective of what got me started a couple of weeks ago, putting this call out for this, creating this summit and really a, a movement and doing things a lot differently. So that's my ambition. Um, without that, I guess we don't get anywhere. So that was my ambition that started this. Chris, in some way or another, tell us something about something you have an ambition for. It could be anything or specifically related to mental wellness or what you're up to. Yeah, it's interesting. In a sense, there's been kind of a an end of having ambition. Um, mm. Yeah, like I'm more just enjoying this, you know, experience, you know. Um, and so just, yeah, more and more happy to just be uh, as I am and sort of like, yeah, be myself and explore. And I guess my interest, you know, with coming on this call and stuff relates to like, I, one of the favorite ways someone has described me that I've heard is a permission giver. And so like, mm -hmm. I like, you know, this kind of giving people permission, you know, to be themselves completely because you know, the best way to live life is to be honest with yourself and basically means just like being as you actually are right here, right now. Um, and so, yeah, I see like a lot of people, you know, uh, are being told that they're, uh, there's something wrong with them. And it's like, like, I remember one of like the uh, most intense moments, like with my dad was him telling me that like, you know, God or the universe makes mistakes and your brain's broken or whatever. And it's like, there's just that intuitive kind of sense of like, no, like everything's perfect. Um, and so, yeah, wanting to, yeah, kind of uh, empower people if they want to be empowered to know that they're perfect as they are. Wonderful. First of all, touche. I'm not having the ambition. You just, you struck that out like a samurai. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so touche on that. And um, that's really cool. I want to get into the, the idea of being a permission giver and, and how it relates to some of your experience. Hillary, how about you, though, as far as the, the quote, without ambition, one starts nothing? What does that bring well, up? Well, I just you? I just looked up the root of the word ambition and where it originally came from. And it originally There's always came from... an etymologist in the house, isn't there, Hillary? Yeah, <laughs> and it means going around. Really? So it's not the drive or the, you know, what we've called ambition in, in, in terms of our current definition. Because when you think about um, um, the word amb, ambi, it is, yeah. it is ambulatory. It's, it's, you know, it comes from the Latin. Um, so, so I love the idea of rather than drive or that more ego kind of, of, of definition, it's, it's is what, you, what are you going around doing? What and going and sort of it sort of mixes with what Chris was talking about of you know letting go of maybe the conventional understanding of ambition and the conventional definition of it and saying maybe I'm just going to wander around and and see what I come across and as I come across whatever I'm I'm going to trust that I'm going to be taken into places that feed my soul that feed my that that feed my ambition <laughs> that may be very latent but I, I also want in the same side. I do want to say thank God that you did pick up what you did, Brett, two weeks ago and decide to take our um, our efforts that we had been um, coagulating <laughs> in a range of different ways and to put and to just uh, open the floodgate. Um, what started with two people is now almost 100 and uh, in less than two weeks. And I want to thank you for, um, you know, for what your ambition actually um, actually fired. Thanks, Hillary. Well, in the Gene Keys book, which is a favorite kind of transformational tool that I use, there's a, a famous quote he, he quotes, which is, 
you have to have a, an ego worth giving up before you self transcend. So I think what he meant by that is like the self actualization part before self transcendence. Like you have to have really created something in order to give it up to some degree to have something established. So uh, thanks for the etymology. That's that's super interesting. It makes a lot of sense looking at it that way. You know, I'm going around without going around feeding your soul in a sense. One starts nothing. You have to have that call, that the passion or the the connection to going out and going around and doing things. So, Chris, what what does it mean to be a permission giver to you? I, I mean, I kind of resonate, identify with that. I imagine to some degree, people might see me that see me that way to some degree because I talk about being outside the box or not caring that sound, something sounds impossible, or of course going up the stream here for many years, like a lot of us saying, you know, mental illness for me, calling it perceived mental illness for one thing, because I don't believe it actually exists fundamentally and trying to get people out of the stories that I think you've had a lot of experience about. Um, if you don't mind, can you share a little bit about the experiences you were having that, you know, created the, even the situation that your dad would have said something like that and, and then maybe tie a little bit in and feel free to talk long, short, whatever. We'll just popcorn, you know, from this point and see, see what emerges. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, the permission giver thing, it does feel like me, like living, I think you've called it story living or whatever, yeah. like me living all out, like not holding anything back kind of just naturally gives other people permission to like, you know, they see that and they're like, oh, that looks fun. And then they're like, oh, maybe I can like do that and they, in their own way and kind of start playing with it. Um, yeah, basically, um, yeah, I'll keep this um, as succinct as possible. So um, I was diagnosed bipolar one when I was 18. Um, I had a, a psychotic break is what they call it. Um, and you know, ended up on all these different meds. I mean, this was after a really stressful, like super stressful period of time. Like it was, you know, nervous breakdown kind of stuff. Um, and identity crisis, yada, yada. And so, um, Basically, um, I, you know, I mean, all as a kid, you know, until that point was super healthy, super happy. And like, it just things started, you know, I was getting indoctrinated into kind of consensus reality more and more. And then, um, yeah, I just reached this kind of breaking point. Um, and yeah, ended up on all these different, you know, they took me to like five different psychiatrists. And of course, they wanted like other opinions. But of course, they all say the same thing, because they're all, you know, trained in the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, ended up on like medications, like cocktails of medications for, I was on medication for 10 years, basically. Um, and yeah, there was all sorts of, yeah, really rough side effects and just, um, it was, it was a very strange time. Um, and lots of therapy too. Like, it'd be funny to see the, the, the total bill that my parents <laughs> paid on my therapy. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and I'm super grateful for all of it. Yeah, it's just like, it was so, so catalytic, you know. Um, and eventually was able to find a, a functional medicine practitioner um, who had these things called Hardy's Nutritionals. I mean, it was a whole, you know, lifestyle shift, you know, just like eating healthier and then like living in a way that was more honest, you know, basically um, just, just, yeah, coming more and more into like um, what felt actually right rather than just like oh i believe this thing is the right thing to do so i'm going to do it um and yeah this functional medicine practitioner had these uh, supplements called hardy's nutritionals they're called daily essential nutrients and so i was able to wean off of the medications using those supplements um and then i also got into like you know i waited a year of being off the the psych meds um, until starting to get involved with a shaman and plant medicine and that was also super powerful and super catalytic um, and so yeah Chris, um, Chris what's the what's the timeline so when you were about 18 you had about a decade and then you met what how so you were about 28 29 when you met met the functional medicine person yeah um, yeah exactly and how old are you now I just like to create a, a little bit of a yeah well it's actually been Maybe I have some of those wrong because it's actually been three. I like I just recently passed the three year anniversary of being completely off of psych meds okay. um, and doing really, really well. Yeah, it was like I'm 34 now. And okay. so, you yeah. know, it was probably like four years ago or something that I started meeting her and stuff. Right. Awesome. 
Cool. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to get a little bit of a of the time scale there. So it's been three three or four years since you transitioned yeah. with working with her and then the shamanism. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, because one of our overlaps is like integral. And so my dad was into integral um, theory when I was like six years old. And he gave me my first Ken Wilber book when I was like <laughs> 18. And that was actually part of what was kind of like blowing up my, my consciousness <laughs> or whatever. Um, and then I had a second kind of like um, psychotic break when I was so I, I went off meds myself when I was like 24 or something like that. Um, and basically, I went to attend an integral conference and then like some stuff went down uh, and then ended up back in the hospital like that time was like for 11 days and then you know back on the meds um, for for a while. Mm. Excellent. And um, how about Hillary, do you have any reflections or questions? Well, it's that? a fascinating pathway because it's one that uh, I think we are hearing quite a, v tracking along very similar lines in terms of, of our first immediate um, reaction to any kind of a physical or mental breakdown is, is we have to go through the doctors and we have to go through the medical professions. And so uh, that's, in, in fact, if we don't do that, there's something wrong with us. So our, our first stop is medical. And then we get caught up into that medical system and, 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 and treated by and through the medical system until we realize it's not working anymore. Yeah. and or and there's too many side effects <laughs> to the medical and then it's a question of okay now now what because we've as society we have relied so exclusively on the medical profession for everything and every kind of disease every kind of ailment it's go to the medical profession um however uh, in many areas we've started to see a breakaway and not just only mental health we've started to see a breakaway in terms of cancer um, and I remember um, I had the great opportunity to be able to help work with uh, the, the Canadian, um, uh, it was the Women's Network for, for Breast Cancer, um, and, and it was all survivors. And the whole focus of that was how to bring uh, alternative medicine into the, um, into the whole realm of, of, of dealing with cancer and with breast, specifically breast cancer. Same thing with HIV. And, and the bringing together of those two worlds was in, in the 90s was just, was just so hard because it was just not seen to be, you were, you were a looney tune if you didn't follow medical advice mm -hmm. and insurance wouldn't cover you. And so many other, there were so many other implications. Now we're seeing that this is becoming a much stronger pathway um, out of the of the clinical and medical field because we're finding that maybe it we don't need that way of understanding the breakdown or whatever was happening maybe this is something that is evolutionary and maybe it's all part of how we break away from the current way of seeing the world and start to see it differently and start to understand it and be in it differently so i applaud you for for making your way through that because often it's very difficult once you're inside that system to break away from it without enormous guilt, without enormous uh, um, shame, without enormous uh, uh, like uh, and debt, <laughs> um, you know, um, of, of moving into a different field that is that is still relatively new. And, and I am going through this with my youngest son right now, who has been entrapped in the system and who himself is saying he doesn't want to do this anymore, but what is the alternative? And it's trying, because there is no one answer for everybody. There's not the same thing for everybody. Um, he also has a strong calling towards shamanism. He has a strong calling towards indigenous practice and understanding. He's a strong calling as an animal communicator. He has a strong calling in that at the same time, he's got another side of his brain that's saying that doesn't make sense. You have to find, you know, there's a, the, you've got to go through the clinical stuff. So he's got, a, a, if you want, like, like very, he's, he was at one time diagnosed schizophrenic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's got these, which I think is just two parts of yourself that are trying to find a way to integrate. And, um, and so that's, that's how I, re I really resonate with what you've talked about and what you're doing and what, and what you have done. And also what we want to do in this, for, this summit is talk about where do, we, where do we go? Not just what we've done, but where do we go? 
Great. Yeah, that was really well said. And that's awesome that your son has you. Um, yeah, I mean, what you maybe think of is like this, you know, one of the cognitive biases is called authority bias. And so it's mm. like, because this person has this piece of paper laminated on their wall or whatever, all of a sudden they know more about what I should do than I do. Um, and so I've been relating to it as like, I'll do my due diligence. Like, you know, if someone tells me something like, I'll, and I'm curious, like I'll check it out and I'll see what the alternatives are. But like the buck stops at like what feels right to me. Yeah. Um, Cause I feel like you're just fucked if you are always listening to other people and not listening to, you know, your experience. It's like this transition I think a lot of us are in is like from orienting to as if there was this kind of objective reality or objective mm. world that had like rules and like certain way that it works to orienting to your experience. Like, okay, this is obviously what's going on for me. And so I'm just going to do this. <laughs> Dude, beautiful. I mean, we have a lot in com we have a lot in common. Um, it took me about a decade as well. Um, similar story on medications and day programs. You know, a lot of people don't expect these things when they look at me, but it was like one flew out of cuckoo's nest. A girl interrupted. Did you ever? I mean, here I am, this kind of smart, generous, good guy, and like always easy. Things were easy for me when I was eighteen or nineteen. I was always considered good looking and smart, and had friends. And and then to be in this position with these day programs, these it's just ludicrous it's ridiculous but i often joke and call it a dark decade of the soul chris rather than a dark night because <laughs> yeah well it's 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 humiliating quite a while. <laughs> yeah it's, it's humiliating and there's there's so much bullying that goes on like that's I, I didn't even tell my parents when i was like going off medication the last time you know because exactly. it's like i don't want to risk the bullying or anything like that <laughs> We have, we have really the same story, which I'm sure is similar to a lot of people, which I agree with you that the paper on the wall from Harvard obviously really affected my parents. But I have to admit, even me being a pretty free spirited person when I was 18 or 19, I also assumed the authority that the, the Harvard degree meant this person knew something that I didn't know. Um, and you really for me, Chris, man, and thank you for going through what you've done and coming out the other side, you know, but it really comes, I did the same thing, man. At some point I had to start weaning off the medicines based on my understanding of reading them. So I started researching too. I was like, I'm a smart guy. I like physics. I like science. Let me start understanding the history of psychiatry. Like, let me start understanding these neurochemical, it's to some degree, you don't even have to be an expert. You just have to start informing yourself. And yes, I too, eventually I had to lie to my, ther my psychiatrist. I also would tell him symptoms I thought to get the medication that I thought I needed compared to what he thought I needed. And I totally had a lie to my parents and all that, which didn't feel good, but it's kind of like almost like an individuation moment. Like, mm -hmm. and it relates to this authority you're talking about. Like, if you don't do it, no one, no one else is going to do it for you. So it's a lot about like empowerment and non victimhood, yeah. I think. And, it, and I'm going to let you respond to that, but I want to tie it into something, Hillary, which is a common story you're going to hear from people like me and Chris is until there is a better external system that's fitting the common thing. And Hillary, you have some experience, I think too, from, from another thing I'll let you say, so I don't say it, but when I got sick and tired of being sick and tired is when I had a chance to change because the system wasn't helping me. There was no, nobody was helping me. So Chris, I was going to ask you, did you also hit the wall of some version of like, how did you, like, I guess the functional medicine person was helpful because they had a different perspective. But did you also have a little bit of like sick and tired of being sick and tired there where you were like, no one is going to rescue me. Like, I've got to, you know, I've got to step up here and I've got to figure things out because I think Hillary, your son also kind of is going to come to that moment too. It won't matter what doctors or don't exist or exist. He's every one of us. I mean, drugs, alcohol, whatever has to have that moment where like we want to live. Um, so Chris, I wonder how you might relate to that, you know, at all, just in some way. Um, yeah, I mean, what's coming up now is it's almost like life is, you know, playing a game with itself where it is, um, there's like this natural increasing of sovereignty um, and this natural, yeah, process of becoming more and more empowered. Um, and it seems like, um, what do you want to say, like, that actually disappointment itself is kind of like the mechanism that helps with that you know it's like you're gonna keep getting disappointed and disappointed uh you know as kind of your process into your own sovereignty 
Um, yeah, wonderful. Hillary, do you have any relate relates to that or? Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm sitting in a quandary. And I'm sitting in a quandary with, you know, I've, I've been through my own addiction journey. And uh, 33 years ago, um, I went into a, a rehab, which was um, basically I was two weeks outpatient and then two years follow up. It was the two years follow up that actually did the trick for me. Um, mine was alcoholism. And um, but I don't I never went to AA. I couldn't stand the idea of going and talking about and I and I appreciate that for every it's always different for everybody. Um, but I do wonder this idea that you have to hit rock bottom before you change. And I do wonder if that is a, a reality for everybody or if that's something we've told ourselves and that's something that's a, 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 a belief we've bought into that isn't necessarily true. And that if we did have alternatives available to us to see what could what else could happen to deal with uh, the discomfort, you have to find the discomfort and the and the issue. Like you have to have a, a, internally something's not working, and that you know you, you're not going to change unless things unless something's not working. But is it that you have to actually go to this rock bottom and and hit it and then decide? Well, I've got to change. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that um, I was very fortunate in, in that when I made my choice to change, it was it was because of my at that time five year old son who was Cameron's older uh, older son older brother, and it was more about I wanted I didn't want to be that kind of mother, it uh, I wanted to be better. It wasn't that I hit rock bottom. I was in jail. I had you know crashed the car and all that kind of stuff. I had got two DUIs, but but I had but I had guardian angels and um incredible guardian angels so so i'm so I, I i think that decision point for us in terms of when something's not working be it mentally physically whatever it might be i would love to explore go, let's go back to that word experiment um the idea of how can we provide people with a range of different experiments that they can engage in to be able to make that shift rather than it's I'm hitting rock bottom and therefore something has to change. Mm. Yeah, well, I would say just to be clear, since this is being recorded for posterity, <laughs> that I also don't resonate with some kind of absolute rule of hitting rock bottom. I would say it would be more related to what you said, which is everyone has a different version of a choice point that makes them want to change like you with being a mother in some senses metaphorically that was a a rock bottom not maybe like jail but it was like your bottom your rock bottom like this matters to me um mm -hmm. so i do want to i do want to be clear about that and i 100 percent don't believe everyone has to have the the most potentially severe wake-up call I, that's why we're going to do with this movement what we're going to do to try to help kind of reduce the time and energy and and effort of all of the the part of the journey that's of the shadow and the mucky and like getting off your feet and kind of try to compress that and make it much smaller part of the journey where most of the journey is about expressing and reaching your potential and having a good time and all these other things so that's that's definitely the case there's um there's no question about that and um and then the juicy part of that maybe for another time is i do wonder on some level if there is an evolutionary rock bottom so not related to mental health, not related to your job, but even as a maybe we're born again thousands of lifetimes or whatever it is. In that case, I wonder if people do maybe need to hit a version of rock bottom on the grandest scale, like it may not even be in this life, quote unquote, or something. But that's a that's a, a pretty big rabbit hole. So uh, in case anyone wants to say another thing on this topic, I'll open the space and then I have a, an idea to sort of ask another question. So. Does anyone else want to relate back to this point? I, I guess I want to talk touch on that evolutionary. Um, and I, as Brett knows, I'm reading this really fascinating book called Hospicing Modernity. And it's uh, it's 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 all about about what we you know dealing with again social change and how we have to it, it calls for radical tenderness as we hospice what is dying around us. And, and you know, it's been very interesting in the last couple of years to actually grieve um, on one hand, the 
to grieve the, the disintegration of a society um, that, that brought me up. Consumerism, capitalism brought me up. And yet I, I know that it's not the right thing anymore. And so allowing myself to hospice that part of, of, of me that still loves the consumerism, still loves the capitalism, but recognizing that for, for most of my life, I have been trying to create the alternative to that. And I think the same thing is that that evolutionary turning point is you come to a place where this doesn't fit anymore. This doesn't isn't it doesn't feel like it's like old clothing that is itchy and scratchy and 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 it just doesn't you just want to take it off because you know that that's not who you are anymore. It's like the skin of the snake has to come off. And and so I think I think we're in that moment evolu in an evolutionary way. And I think that mental health and a lot of different indicators are playing their role in helping us understand what's not fitting anymore and what is it we want to change. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the end of capitalism is the end of this transactional sort of dynamic that we have with people. And I, I heard you talking about that, Brett, and I really like it because for the last two and a half years, like I've been living outside of that paradigm. Like I haven't been in a transactional mode and it's felt so wonderful because I feel like the transactional mode is like a conditional mode. And so you're constantly in this like conditional, like, oh, well, these people, I'm only hoarded if I do this, if I do that. But the more that you live outside of that paradigm, it's like, oh my God, like I'm supported unconditionally no matter what. And that feels so relieving and amazing. Mm. Chris, how exciting is it going to be to, to provide this kind of thing at scale to, to the world? Like, that's it. That's, that's my like happy spot. We're going to create things that allow that to be the case for people. Yeah, I mean, whatever happens, happens. I mean, I'm, I'm just here for whatever, you know, I'm excited. I don't really have an agenda or anything. <laughs> That's good. We balance each other out. I want. To, I, want to, I, I have an agenda. I've. I've come. I'm reincarnated within this incarnation on a mission. So, um, although I don't really care if it happens or not on a very cosmic scale, um, but uh, I wanted to ask you, Chris. So, your dad, based on his interest in, I guess, integral and all that, now three years, four years later, after the ten years, and you've been probably thriving to some degree in your own way now. And, off, have you guys had any other conversations? Is he, has he changed his perspective at all? What, is there anything you could share about that? Um, we don't really talk about it very much. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, I mean, he lets me be myself. He's like, you know, he's understanding that uh, I'm going to be myself no matter what. And so he's, um, I mean, he loves me a lot. My parents are wonderful. I mean, they're, you know, they've been super supportive. Um, they, you know, everyone's doing the best they can. Um, yeah. But yeah, we don't really, we don't really talk about it much now. They just want to see me happy and doing well. Like that's their bottom line. And so as long as I'm doing well, it's like, they're cool. <laughs> My parent, I, Chris, I used to say to my friends now the last 10 years, my new friends, I said, because a lot of them are still dealing with expectations from their parents. A lot of my friends are overachievers, you know, like, and their parent, whatever. I said to my friends, I, I sufficiently lowered my parents' expectations when I was 20. So everything after the psychiatric yeah. ward, Chris, everything <laughs> after the psychiatric ward, they're like, yeah, Brett's in love. He's married. He's traveling the world. He must be doing good. So it's all and, we're very, and we're very lucky, Chris. I, I imagine in your times when you have where you maybe were in the hospitals or you've seen a lot of people that their families can't handle the stress and they leave them behind that's one of the problems with those day programs a lot of people get left behind the families can't hack it financially emotionally psychologically so we're very lucky my parents also don't necessarily get me but I was very lucky that they could love me to the best of their ability so we're very lucky and Hillary like you, you were saying Hillary you know her son has Hillary this is we're more the exception than the rule so which is another reason to try to do our best to to provide these things because a lot of people it's like don't have the kind of families we've had so yeah. shout out shout out to the cool the parents that that make it through with us <laughs> So, so I just have a question for, for Chris around the fact that you, you know, you're not living in the transactional world. Um, and, and so, so what brings you joy? Uh, what, uh, what, what's life like for you? It's pretty whimsical, honestly. Like, yeah, it's a lot of like, I mean, I live in this kind of low income uh, housing sort of uh, apartment situation. And so I have like a lot of funny characters that like live around me. <laughs> There's like three things that they don't have, which is like teeth, cars and jobs. <laughs> and um like that's part of the non-transactional thing is that like because they don't have cars and i do like i become the guy who like 
is the ride. Um, and like, and it always just feels like, you know, I always check in with myself, like, do I actually want to give them a ride right now? And it's like, if I do, then I do. And if I don't, then I don't, you know, and it's like, it's all good. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of just like having fun with friends and like working on things that I'm actually interested in and, you know, just like in entertainment that I'm actually interested in. And, um, yeah, I'm kind of like writing, you know, I write kind of a lot and there's kind of maybe a book that's kind of forming itself. And, um, yeah, just like, listen, I dance a lot, you know, I'm part of a dance community and, um, I just like to, yeah, yeah. I mean, dancing is actually an amazing, amazing practice. It's probably been one of the most powerful things like up there with psychedelics. And then if you dance while you're on psychedelics, you know, it's a whole, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like, um, I like outdoorsy stuff too. And so it's just like, I love living in a way where it's just every day is kind of like, um, what feels right, what feels good, you know, like I'm, I'm so done with like the whole doing things the hard way kind mm. of paradigm. It feels like, you know, I, I do take the path of least resistance because I love myself. Um, and so, yeah, that just, you know, Beautiful. feels, um, and, and, and sometimes that even does look like doing something challenging that I want to do, like, I don't know, working out or asking a girl on a date or something, but you know, um, yeah, it doesn't always look like that. It's, just it's one other qu follow up question, if I could, just once is mm -hmm. is th this is fantastic because what you're finding are ways of expressing yourself, but also expressing the world around you and 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 being part of the world around you. when you dance, you're part of an energy field. Right. And you're just you're in the moment. You're in the energy field. The characters that you must be living around. There, there is a book in that. Like these characters are just. The, I, I can only imagine. I just want to come back to the thing you talked about, the shaman, and and what what that experience was, and how you found how that's influenced these types of activities that you're involved in on a daily basis. Hmm. Well, there was. Um... So I got into this thing. So kind of after Integral, I got into this um, guy, my mentor, Peter Brown, which is interesting that this is not number 555 because Peter Brown lives at 555, my mentor. And so, yeah. Um, and I was just on his Zoom call, like right before this. Um, so, yeah. Um, but like I got, he, he, he teaches this thing called the yoga of radiant presence. And radiant presence is just his favorite word for what this is, what this reality is. Um, and yoga is being used in the sense of like exploration. So exploring what this is, you know, by running all the experiments that you want to run. Um, and basically with the shaman, you know, there, there's uh, quite a few ceremonies that I've done with him, but there was one in particular where I just like, yeah, was, uh, all of a sudden identified as this absolutely like unlimited dimension. Um, and it was just like such a game changer because it's like, oh, it's like my parents never told me about this. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's just like the work with the shaman has shown me that reality is unlimited, that I am unlimited, that I am this, I am reality. Um, and so it's just been this further deconditioning from consensus reality, you know, all the kind of delusional uh, indoctrination that we receive, um, which is also, it's like, it's so trippy because even that indoctrination is itself reality kind of playing a game mm. with itself. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Hillary, did you want to follow up? On that no, or? I just think it's fab that, 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 that breaking open, um, to see, to understand the world in a different way, the field in a different way that yeah. when you broke that open, the, you, you start, you have found ways of interacting in that field and with that field and expanding that field in, in, in very artistic ways. And I, mm -hmm. and I think that that's a, uh, that's a real, uh, is a game changer because as you dance and as you write and as you do all these, you know, these, these and, and live your, uh, drive these pieces <laughs> and get, and, and be a chauffeur at all the different <laughs> things you're doing, um, you know, you yourself are, are bringing healing in, mm -hmm. uh, in a really interesting and unique way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, thank you for saying that because it has been interesting seeing some of my neighbors, like how they warm up to me not actually being in a transactional mode because they'll start off feeling like guilty or like asking for a ride. Like it's like hard for them to actually ask for help or ask for a ride. But then as like we get kind of more comfortable in our relationship, it's just like they don't even hesitate to ask. Yeah. I'm really glad you asked this, Hillary. Um, 
because a couple of things became evident to me. Um, hey, one, by the way, Chris, I don't have a job. I don't have a car. And these teeth are actually fake because I lost what? my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Killing it. So we're, we're uh, best buds. It's like, I, 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 I live there. So it's like I live there. Um, but in asking that question, <laughs> in asking that qu question, Hillary, um, I mean, I'm having aha moments talking to Chris and Mark the other day. And Chris, I was saying to Mark the other day, I've been involved the last 10 years in like all this like systems design and social architecture and software and activism and my own kind of conscious evolution. And this mental health journey has been personal and I've kind of been working it from different angles, but not as a project, so to say, or, um, or an ambition for lack of a better word. So I wasn't really aware of all the people like me who are speaking the way you are and, and tuning into some things, which I'll share in a minute, but it's quite emotional and refreshing and amazing to, to meet you and to meet everyone in this case, to meet you, Chris, um, because so first of all, I didn't mention it, but one of the reasons I call this a playcast and not a podcast is because the word illusion means to play. So one of my kind of taglines is use your delusion because we need to use our play, which is exactly what you're doing. It, for me, it just, I like to reframe these like delusion. Why, why did everyone, anyone ever say that was a bad or good thing? It's, it is what it is, but use it to your advantage or use it for your, your well-being rather than using it for what it what it's not serving you um so like to hear you talk about you know understanding yourself to be infinite awareness or whatever you know to be in a space with people where we're talking about this and we're not needing to defend that you know to the authorities or to be worried that that's going to create some situation where we're hospitalized and all that stuff it's it's quite amazing for me to come full circle i discovered this happened to me. My first episode like yours was 1994. I'm 47 now. Um, and I was into Ken Wilber and all that. So um, it, all that stuff blew my mind. But what really struck me, the most important thing I took away from the last segment was, Chris, what these conversations are going to reveal in real time, which is why I feel so good about just having these conversations. Like, I don't need funding for that. I don't need a big website to do this. But there's, it's so valuable because what you shared is the integral way you are thriving, dance, being in service to people, writing, laughing, you know, non-transactional, like you, you are sharing with the world because there's no magic bullet for this perceived mental illness. Everyone has a different path, but there are patterns, we would, you know, archetypal patterns, let's say, because it's no, obviously it's no uh, coincidence that bipolar, you know, we have a lot of similar experiences like spending money and, and staying awake and having visions, you know, there's something interesting about that, like, because I don't mind labels when they're not used as weapons, right? There's nothing wrong for me, like, you know, the bipolar experience gives me an idea of what someone is experienced compared to the obsessive compulsive experience, or the schizophrenia experience, I don't mind the categories to help orient you, you know, to kind of where you're at in the territory it's only when they become these sledgehammers you know to the, that are used kind of against us that the, the categories and the labels become a problem so i just want to say thanks for for sharing that last segment because it's like real time this is what i believe people kind of need to hear you don't necessarily need medications to go to therapists you need to follow your bliss you need like the transactional world is causing again this is where the mental illness question becomes more about the whole ecosystem, not just any, you know, sick individual. There's also the factors of all of these different pieces. So I was fine. I found it really enlightening to hear about how you've transitioned really into transforming what I call perceived mental illness into a blessing. Like, I mean, so thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And yeah, as you were talking, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that kind of peeved me a little bit was like how much the bipolar experience is different for it's, it's so unique for each individual. And so like, I remember getting annoyed, like getting kind of grouped in with all these other people where it's like, we're all having a totally unique experience. It's like, I like what you said one time, Brett, which was like that, you know, it's this pathologizing of the human experience itself and where that line is drawn is completely arbitrary of like, <laughs> this is okay and normal. And this is not, you know, and, yeah. and, 
normalcy is actually a fantasy. Like there's no such thing as normalcy. Um, it's like weirdness is the norm, you know, or, or uniqueness <laughs> is the norm. Like we're yeah. all absolutely unique. And so, um, yeah. And the other thing that just coming to mind right now is like how silly it is, how much of a numbers game it kind of is, because if I am all by myself believing that there's like this flying spaghetti monster in the sky or something coming to get me, or it's going to come like, you know, take me, uh, the ascension is going to, you know, happen, then people are going to think I'm crazy. But if a large group of people all believe that, then like within their group, it's like, you'd be crazy not to, to believe in that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And then finally, it's like, there's also the element where it's like, people can kind of be assuming that they're talking about the same thing, mm -hmm. but they're totally not. So like, a word like ego or something, you know, I could say the word like ego and then the other person would be like, oh yeah, ego. But it's like, you know, that, that word has so many different meanings to so many different people that it's like, you guys don't actually, you guys aren't actually talking about the same thing. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I want to also just share in a sense, the most interesting perhaps, or for me, important thing you said, which is you found a way or a path to love yourself. In my, in my opinion, that is the, there's two things to me that are the cure to perceived mental illness. One is some version of detachment, separation between you and your experience. So like you can't, to know that you are infinite awareness, it, it takes like kind of a little bit of that, not this, not like I, this identifying with all the impulses and the urges and the visions and like, so there's some version of like detachment. It's not the right word, but it's important to me. And then loving yourself because it even goes back to the authorities and your parents. Like no one is really going to ultimately be able to provide that version of love that makes the difference because that you have to find within. So I just want to celebrate and, and acknowledge that I also agree with you. Like loving myself was the, 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 the thing that mattered the most in a sense, or the thing that yeah. keeps, that also keeps me going in a sense, because there's that fallback is the infinite awareness, loving myself, you know, that, that's my medicine, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word, like. Totally, like, yeah, I mean, I, I've referred to it as a pandemic of self hate, like just so many people are just, there's so much shame and guilt. And I think some, the reason why a lot of people stay so busy all the time or, or sometimes why they are so ambitious and seeking for these big goals and outcomes is because they don't love themselves. And like, if they didn't have this big thing to strive for, then it's like, what am I left with? Like, I really have to just like love myself. <laughs> so what's really, what's really fascinating for me as I listen to this is, is that we, we wrote some time back, about two years ago when we first started a call to the mothers, which is our, was our original, um, way of putting a call out to the fact we had to change what we were what how mental illness and addiction were being framed and we put out one of the statements was what if um those that are deemed to be mentally ill or addicts are actually pioneers um in in co-designing and co-creating a new way of well-being and um and what came to me as you were talking because i took i wrote down the word syst uh uh that you talked about brett you said systems uh, you know, systems change and systems design. And, and in, in our old world, that's always been an engineering role, like engineer system design and the engineering mentality and the, and the, you know, the world is mechanical and all of that. You are a system designer, Chris. You are changing, you, it says, oh, to me, you've, you're creating a new archetype from the engineer who system designs and architects who system design to your system redesigning through your dance, through your interactions with your community, through the different, for loving yourself, all the things you described, you're a new archetype of a system designer. And as you continue to do that, and as others start to, as you say, when people are around you, they start to start to feel that kind of vibe and they'll find, hopefully find their, whatever's calling them in terms of their, their, uh, what brings them their joy, their, their, uh, their aha, whatever it might be. But I think this is to me a huge aha I just got, but the whole idea of systems design being a, this, an archetype like you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I see it as like, reality is creating itself now always now 
by pure magic, basically, for the purposes of play, exploration, experimentation, right. Right. whatever. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's system redesign mm. at its best, because <laughs> that's <laughs> how the reality shifts. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, amazing. So Chris, tell us a little bit about this book, maybe, or what, well, so, you're gonna touche me. I know if I don't if I don't ask you the right way, you're gonna you're gonna slam me down again. The samurai wisdom. Um, I just want to know more about your your kind of creativity, uh, external creativity in a sense. Like obviously dancing is creative. Yeah. You know, serving people is creative. So I just mean more like the book or like. And I also wanted to ask you, Chris, over the years while you were struggling. So for me, I was stuck in. A, a, in a low rent apartment. It was actually quite nice. So for 10 years, I was getting like $800 a month. I lived in New Jersey, by the way. So I was getting social security supplemental income, $800 a month. I was getting an apartment that was $100 a month. And basically my parents were middle-class enough to make sure I had a car and car insurance. And then I basically used credit cards to survive, which I have mm -hmm. no, some people get on my case and I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm not even getting into that. The credit card companies don't care and it's all a game. So yeah, like I was, I was gonna I needed to survive. And like, so that's how I, but it was kind of living abundantly to be honest. Like, you, like the light side to what happened to me was I had a lot of time to study things that I wanted to study. I had a lot of times to do self inquiry. So I've always said my only vocation has been self inquiry. Cause as soon as I went into this existential kind of moment, I, I started like Ramana Maharishi, who am I and all the integral stuff. So I actually used that decade. I would read a book a day at some point. Cause I just like different subjects, you know, like, like a lot of us, I'm a Renaissance type person. So I kind of, at least I got out of that a homegrown education about the things I love to do. I made a record one year when I was depressed. I wrote a screenplay for two years. So I'm wondering if you could weave in a little bit, like were you, over the last 10 years, the 10 years prior to the last four, were you also able to pop in and out of school? Were you reading? Were you learning anything? Like, or was it all kind of dark in a sense? Like, Yeah, no, <laughs> I actually, uh, I graduated, like I got a master's degree from Naropa, you know, in transpersonal right. counseling psychology. Oh, right. you, I remember you mentioning that because that's yeah. when I started reading Ken Wilber, that was the first place I wanted to go, basically. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And right. then I actually worked. So before I went to Naropa and after I went to Naropa, I worked with this company called Windhorse Community Services, which is an alternative mental health agency in Boulder, okay. Colorado. Oh. Um, and yeah, I mean, I made videos like when I was starting in like 2013 or something, I like um, under the name Everything Kids just started making these these videos that were like, um, yeah, it kind of felt like just like, like it's impossible for me. It's like, yeah, it's so frustrating to not be able to communicate my experience. And so that's what I found so wonderful about these videos. I mean, it's kind of like a unique way of making videos. I call them like collage uh, videos or collage art. Cause I'm just like stitching together a bunch of ideas that seem to kind of flow together. Um, yeah. but it'll kind of, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's hard to explain, but I just like, yeah. it felt so good to just like, be like, okay, like this is, what I want to express, you know, because <laughs> you could do that with, with art, you know? Um, and so, yeah. And then the book is kind of an extension of like my, um, experience with Peter Brown and the, the yoga of radiant presence. Um, cause I also have been in this, yeah, self inquiry for a long time. I mean, my favorite question is what is this? <laughs> um, and yeah, it's like, there's, um, so many fun ways to like, uh, yeah, to like express this. And so the book is, is kind of that. Right on. I'm so Chris, with the caveat, you're obviously going to go with the flow. I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if you see any yourself, you know, somehow directly in a sense contributing or being a part of what this thing is that uh, we're trying to kind of have emerged like I don't mean by commitment wise I mean do you see yourself kind of participating in some way would you like would you share at a summit about your experiences like are you cool are you interested in again without who knows what will happen but I'm just curious if if you 
like to share about or what would be exciting for you even though you got to live in the now <laughs> yeah i mean i'm always i'm always making game time calls and kind of taking things one variable at a time um but yeah i mean maybe i mean i'm excited about kind of just whatever seems exciting and like yeah right now i mean if you had a conference or something i mean i would definitely consider it so um yeah just always happy to you know participate in in any way that yeah feels right and so you can always reach out to me and kind of check in and stuff Cool. What would it, what would need to be, uh, like what, what seems exciting? So for you, yeah. what, what would exciting be? Um, maybe if there was like, um, you know, just talking like this is exciting. And then also if there's like people that have questions or something and that they want, had to have answered, um, I could do my best to kind of like, um, you know, share things that they're interested in, um, and stuff like that. I mean, I'm also excited about like the possibility of, um, you know, some kind of actual building, you know, some kind of like physical space where it's like, you know, <laughs> the whole intention is to help people. Yeah. That don't want to go to the conventional kind of, you know, ways of, of doing it. Um, so yeah, I know that in the past that that's been very difficult for some places like Soteria, like it's just can be really hard on the staff and, and stuff like that. But I'd be curious about, you know, playing around with those kind of models. Yeah, you know, it's uh, one second early. I'm, I'll pass it back to you in a second. What's interesting, Chris, is first of all, that you did work kind of in the field. I also, when I was 30 in my kind of, when I turned things around, I went back to school for two years and I thought I was going to do like psychosocial rehabilitation. So I did an internship where I got to work at a day program. Uh, you would have loved it because I had the happiness agenda. That was the program I got to institute at the day program. But I didn't have to fill in all the paperwork, thank God. So I actually got to implement the happiness agenda rather than yeah. say I'm going to do it. <laughs> right, I, actually, right. I, actually, I actually got to do it and interact with the consum consumers um, compared to most of the beautiful people that were working there. But because of the bureaucracy and the pay and the stress, they really stopped serving the population in any revolutionary way. They just became babysitters and they got brought down. So... So I totally hear you about a physical space needing to be equally as abundant for the care, the caregivers, you know, as it is for the people. That is like one of the exactly. most important things. So it's really interesting that we both had, we've been on all sides of the equation, you know, like on each side of the desk and all that. So, so that's really cool. To, I really, that's the kind of thing I wanted to know, because we're going to be taking you up on that on some level, um, because I'm not stopping until we have those places all over the planet. And cool. the staff is all taken care of. And it's all freely accessible and we can make money in other ways. There's no, there's no limits to, to what we're going to do really about sustaining something like this. The old business models are obsolete and stuff. So I'm, I'm excited that that's something you might, you might be uh, interested in. Go ahead. Ellie. That sounds interesting. Well, because I'm thrilled to hear what you said, because it's exactly why we started call to the mothers <laughs> was the original idea was to undertake research, to understand what could this physical entity be? And what did it need to contain? And what did it need to have? And and um, and what was not only the business case but the the heart case uh, for 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 why this needed to exist? And so the whole idea of the summit is also for with as two, it, it's got three sort of layers to it in terms of continuing to do this research around where the breakdowns in the system are, where the opportunities are this in the system, where's the grief happening in the system and where's the possibilities for a new emergent one to, to come forward. And at um, and, and the same time, looking at how, what is the design criteria that we need to be able to, to, to create an, a physical entity um, and what would it have to contain and all and that kind of thing. And the third thing is a, mo is, is a, is a crisis um, uh, uh, mobile crisis uh, response unit that we want to pilot, which is, which is, it came out of the, the original research we did uh, a year ago, which was this kind of Winnebago that shows up when there's, instead of when police are called, when there's a, a, a mental health crisis, that this Winnebago shows up, it's got the most beautiful lighting, furniture, plants, uh, music, uh, dog, um, it is a totally different environment that you come into and automatically your nervous system just recalibrates and brings you down to a, to a, a, a place where you can actually connect and actually think. And, and then, and then we have an opportunity to explore some different modalities 
um, to be able to recalibrate at that moment and to look at what could a next step be? What's a, what's a different kind of assessment and what could a next step be? That would then lead to this physical act, you know, place that you could actually go to from the, from, the mobile, from the mobile unit. But the mobile unit is the idea is to start introducing this kind of, this radical thinking about there's an alternative in a very sort of concrete, uh, very sort of um, um, experimental, but evaluative way to see what is the difference when that shows up versus the cop car. And, um, and so again, those, those, those were the sort of the three sort of layers when we started looking at the summit. And so the idea that you would be interested in exploring what would a physical place be and for from from out from all this different uh, players viewpoint uh, because we I truly believe in what I've experienced is that the system itself is traumatized because it's never had a chance to to for respite it's never mm -hmm. had a chance to heal um, the people in the system have never had the chance like the the, the caregivers uh, they, they mostly many of them come into this calling because of their own background and they've never themselves had a chance to heal so I just yeah. want to say how grateful that you said that um, because that's so aligned with with uh, with what we wanted to do with the summit. Cool. Yeah. And that's what the psych words kind of become is this kind of like when people do just need some kind of respite, you know, they end up just having a nervous breakdown and going there. But it's like it could just be so much better. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's the last place you're gonna find peace and quiet and rest and <laughs> and it's it's quite paradoxical, isn't it? Every like you're saying, everyone's there for a similar reason, yet throwing everyone like that at that moment in their lives together in a yeah. small floor of a hospital is like <laughs> I've always said I just it's just weird how groupthink takes over common sense. So like my my famous story is, you know, when I would go to the hospital like and they thought I was in a crisis of some kind mental crisis. So they take my blood, they make me sit there for eight hours. And then in the waiting room, while I'm waiting to get my basically future taken away from me, by the way, so I'm already like super stressed out. There's a big 80 inch screen TV playing the nightly news. Yeah. And like, if you asked any psychiatrist in a quiet space and you had their attention and you asked them, do you think it's a good idea to have an 80 inch TV broadcasting the news in a room where psychotic people are waiting for eight hours? They would all say that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Everyone knows that people often get messages from the TV when they're in psychotic states and schizophrenia. So anybody, if you ask the doctor, they would say, no, of course, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But yet downstairs from their ivory towers in the hospital, that is what happens. And it's just like, it doesn't, it just, Honestly, like shame on them on, to some degree, like I'm not here to blame people, but it's a little bit like, but this is why we all have to pick up the stick, you know, for me, in my opinion, like we have to become, if anything, we have to become the self driven authorities that use collective intelligence and creativity and compassion because boy, the, the, the authority figures now are kind of clueless. I'm going to end it on that. Let's, let's do a round of, uh, just check out gratitude. Um, I can, I'll, I'll finish it up. Hillary, do you mind sharing like just any conclusions? I'm just thrilled to have this conversation with you, Chris. It's just, it's, it's again, it, it, it confirms so much of what we have been exploring and, and the idea of ongoing experimentation. We don't have the answers, um, but we know collaboratively we'll find them and, um, and that we'll co-create a very different kind of reality around, around the, uh, guided by what has been called mental illness <laughs> that is coming out and saying well you know um there's another way to do this and 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 it's actually is the canary in the mine shaft for society and mm -hmm. saying as we start to find these ways together it the, the larger population is also going to be the one that's going to be the big winner because we'll have done the experimentation on behalf of everybody 
because they're <laughs> because this is something that everybody's going to need at some point in time. And unfortunately, those who are dealing with the acute side of, of, of things right now um, are are the drivers in terms of uh, of making sure that we we do deal with it differently. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank you for, for, for who you are, for your journey, for sharing your journey. And, and we would just love you to be part of helping us design this summit so that we can design this place and, uh, and, and, and start co-creating co in a concentrated kind of way to see what could be possible. Right on. Chris, how about you? Awesome. Yeah, no, I'm just super grateful to be here and be in the fold and get to meet you guys. And I'm just glad that this, you know, talking about this stuff has value for you guys because it's just fun to talk oh. about. Um, and yeah, just excited to see, you know, what happens. I mean, it's my experience now is that like this is completely out of control and it's intelligent. And so, like, you know, like, let's see what this, uh, <laughs> this can do. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, just thank you both very much uh, for being here and having me and looking forward to more diving in. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Hillary, as always, for being my partner in the greatest heist in history. Heistery. <laughs> I call it heistery. We're stealing it. We're, they, we're stealing it back. <laughs> We're stealing our sanity back, the great heist. Um, thank you for, for being on the journey with me, Hillary. And Chris, thank you for taking some time today. Um, like I said, paradoxically weird that I've not had all these conversations. I've been having these kind of conversations on my journey in person, right? So I've learned a lot about, I've met a lot of people like us on my daily, which I think I've been building, I guess maybe gave me the confidence to start saying, well, this is what I'm seeing. Like, this is what we're seeing and it, it has value. So yeah, Chris, thank you for sharing. I believe these conversations are super important. And if any, there could be one person in the world that sees this conversation and has a better day or has a son or daughter or husband or wife and has a new idea or just understands that nothing's impossible and whatever you've been told is probably wrong and go find the others basically. So I'm glad we found you, Chris. Thank you for coming. Yes, my pleasure. Okay. All right. Thank we'll you. see you next time. We'll do this again sometime, obviously, as well. Lots of love, Chris. Lots of love, Hillary. Lots of love. Uh, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.